Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves the children dear, children far away or near. They are safe when in his care, every day and everywhere. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine. Make it pure and holy thine. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Hello, and welcome once again to our virtual services here at Ephesus Church of Christ in Athens, Alabama. We're so glad that you have clicked on to follow us in our worship to God. We we're going to have a uh, song, some, some scripture and lessons. We'll have uh, some songs again, partaking of the Lord's Supper, and uh, we'll have one last song to finish us up. We're so glad that you've chosen to spend your Lord's Day in worship to Him, regardless of the circumstances that you may find yourself in. It's at times like these that people will oft, often find themselves either a lot closer to God or further than they've ever been. It's at times like these that it requires us as individuals, regardless of whether you find yourself further from God and more abandoned or closer to God than you've ever been. It's always a good time for prayer. And that is exactly what his apostles asked Jesus to teach them. Lord, teach us to pray. And that's what our study will be this morning. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. This pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laid? the 
Savior still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. So, if you wanted to learn how to play basketball, or you wanted to learn how to run fast, or maybe you wanted to learn how to dig oil in Texas, and you couldn't get in touch with me, you'd probably need to call some other expert. But in all seriousness, if you wanted to learn how to play basketball, you may try to get in touch with Michael Jordan or Larry Bird, or Steph Curry, somebody that knows how to play the game. If you want to learn how to golf, you might try to take pointers from Jack Nicklaus or Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, if you're left-handed. You'll try to find somebody that is a master and knows that field. If you wanted to run fast, you would try to get in touch with somebody that can run a 440, not somebody that runs a 4040. You might try to get in touch with Usain Bolt. Or you, you might go out to Texas and dig those oil wells. And you could dig and dig and dig and, and maybe by chance and get lucky and hit an oil rig, hit an oil well, rather, with your oil rig, or you might find a master, somebody that knows how to dig wells and somebody that knows how to find out the best place to start digging. You find somebody that knows what they're doing, and then you learn from them all that you can. Throughout Jesus' teaching, throughout his time here on this earth and, and his disciples following him around, they asked him specifically one thing. One thing that they could learn, one thing that they could do, they asked him, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And they, they never really asked, uh, Lord, teach us how to give a sermon to make millions follow us and be believers. They, uh, teach us how to raise the dead. Jesus, teach us how to make the sick well, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see. They said, Master, teach us to pray. In Luke chapter 11, verses 1, 13, 1 through 13 is where we will go for the bulk of our study today. And it says in verse 1, it says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. And he said to them, When you pray, say, they never asked for that idea about casting out demons. And they asked him, teach us to pray. And, and that tells you a lot about someone in their faith walk. You can tell a lot about somebody by the way they pray, how often they pray, whether they take time out of their day to pray, how they go about praying, and even, as it happened with Christ so many times, where he prayed. Christ oftentimes prayed, and his disciples saw that, and they saw his faith in action by the way that Christ prayed. So when they went out to learn how to pray, they did not ask some rabbi or some other teacher. They asked the man whose faith and whose prayer life showed one who was dedicated in prayer. And they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. He said to them in Verse 2, continuing on, it says, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive, as we also, as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Jesus teaches his disciples a very simple, short prayer. A prayer that at some point in your life, many of you have memorized or learned or, and hopefully still remember to this day. Uh, when I was uh, in high school playing football, we would wrap up every practice and every game with this prayer. We would pray the Lord's Prayer. Although be it that many who 
would just say the words and be no kind of prayer. And even I myself many times would simply just quote the words or sometimes at the very least I would move my lips. But all people at some point have hopefully been exposed to the Lord's Prayer and learning from it and learning some things that He teaches us that we should pray for. So for what should we pray? Christ teaches a few basic things that we should all pray for. He teaches us that we have a holy and an honorable Father and that His name should only be used with reverence. We should never just loosely or flippantly just pronounce the Lord's name. We should honor God's name. Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. It is a name that should be set apart. It's be set apart above all other names. It's not the thing that we should take in vain. And if we remember back to the Ten Commandments, we shall not take the Lord's name in vain. We should pray to our holy and righteous Father in heaven. We should recognize that everything comes from God, and we are dependent upon Him for our very being. Give us this day our daily bread. Everything that brings us life and even that brings us death comes from God. God has given us all things for our very existence. It, it, many times we oftentimes say that, you know, we, we lose this connection for God because I went to work and I made money and, and I did some deal and I made money and I got money and I took that money and I, I went to the store and I went down to hometown and I bought that milk and that bread and I, bought, and I brought that milk and bread home and I had me a bread and milk sandwich. It's this idea that I did all of these things. And we lose the focus of our lives that we are, in fact, dependent upon God for everything. And so our prayer to God should not only be, Thank you, Lord, for providing, but also, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Every day, God gives us the things that we need. We should not be so miskewed, if it, if you will, that we think, well, God, give me everything today for the next 10 years. Well, he's going to give us each day the things that we, that we need for the day. If you think about what the Israelites got while they were traveling in the wilderness, they got each day that thing which they needed. It is not about storing up more. For the, in fact, the Israelites learned that when they stored up more, it ruined, and it was full of worms, and it was no good. We are given by God every day the things that we are needed daily. We learned that we should pray that and understand that sin is a bad thing and that He is the forgiver of sins and that we should be asking for the forgiveness of our sins and in a like way we should also be forgiving of others. We need to forgive those who have done us wrong, who are indebted to us, and we need to ask God as well for forgiveness of our sins that we have done as we are indebted unto Him. And when we do wrong, we need to be forgiven of that. And when others do us wrong, we need to be generous and loving as God is and forgive them of that. Forgiving them does more for you in the releasing of them and that thing that they had done wrong against you. You were saying, I, I, I'm done with it. I'm over it. I have forgiven you. Even though maybe that person has not asked for forgiveness or has sought out and said, I'm sorry, uh, it is saying something to you and to God of saying they are forgiven. I have forgiven them. I hold that wrong against them no more. And then when we go to God in prayer, we understand that he is faithful and just to forgive us. When we ask for forgiveness of our sins and we, do, and we turn from our ways, he is faithful and just and he will forgive us. He wants to forgive us. His desire is that all men everywhere should repent. We ought to pray for forgiveness of sins. And one other thing that he teaches in this passage here is that we should pray to be bold and strong enough to overcome temptation no matter the circumstances. We should ask God to help us avoid temptation, help us find that way of escape and to be strong and to be bold enough to take it. We, we oftentimes, or I oftentimes, pray to God that we should be forgiven and, and that's it. And then the next time I see sin, I take it again. We should pray to God to give us strength and to give us courage to find that way of escape. 
to look for that way of escape and to take that way of escape that we sin no more, no matter the circumstances, no matter where we may find ourselves in, and even at times like it is right now, that we should find that way of escape. Continuing in verse 5 of our passage here, it says, And he said to them, Which of you has a friend who will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I will ask you, and I will and I tell you ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks it will be opened what father among you if his son asks for a fish will instead of a fish give him a serpent or if he asks for an egg will give him a scorpion if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will the heavenly father give the holy give the holy spirit to those who ask him you know we have a god who hears the petitions of his people who is a loving and generous and caring father and we we may be you know I, I don't I can't help you, friend, because you know I'm already asleep or I'm away. I'm not I can't do anything for you. Or, or we as as people we we oftentimes we just go I don't want to be bothered by that. Well, we are sinful in nature. We are imperfect people, but yet so many times we find ourselves trying and wanting to do the things that can help others. And in this time of our nation today, for the virus that separates us from being together in, phys- in a physical nature, we are finding so many ways to help those. And we could be full of excuses and really, and quite honestly, good reasons as to why we can't do things for others. But so many people are trying and doing and finding ways to help in some small way to other people. And we are sinful and perfect people. And God the Father, who is perfect, who is, you know, without fault, how much more will he do for you? Like a father to his son, giving him all the things that he needs in whatever way I can help my son, I'm going to help my son. I'm going to do what I can do to help him. I'm going to give him what I can give him to help him. How will a loving Father in heaven help his children out? We who are full of evil, helping out those in need, How much more will God help those who, him being perfect? In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, this verse and this passage has become quite popular during this time of turmoil in our nation. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 13, it says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We should humble ourselves, not only just because we have some misfortune come our way, but in all times. We should be humbling ourselves before God and His throne. We must remember that the Lord is the Lord God and that we should always call upon His name. And with fervent prayer, make supplication before our Lord, our God. We should always be praying. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, it's a very simple command. Pray without ceasing. Does that mean that we ever stop? No, we should always be about our prayer and our conversation to God. We should always be focused on talking to Him and, and, and that we should pray to Him and pray to Him all night. We think about Daniel. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, it says says to us, Daniel prayed three times a day. And we may think, well, I pray, pray three times a day too. I pray at breakfast, I pray at lunch, and I pray at supper. Well, that's three times a day. Well, is that not enough? 
Is that enough time to pray to God? I don't know. How often do you want to talk to your friends? We sang the song before this lesson, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. How often times do we spend talking to our friends? Well, we talk to our friends almost without ceasing. In some way, shape, form, or fashion, whether that's in the flesh and we talk to them physically or over the phone or with telecommunication or we text or we send some sort of message or email, we're in constant connection with our friends. Should we not always be in constant connection with our God? Should we not always be praying to Him? Maybe we should pray once a day all day long. Well, I start in the morning and I quit when I go to sleep. Maybe that would be enough. We should always be about praying. Always being about finding a way to pray. Jesus oftentimes would slip away to pray. Here's a few verses in Matthew 14, verse 23, Mark 6, 46, Mark 1, 35, Luke 6, verse 12, and Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, how often did Jesus slip away to pray? In some circumstances, he would take a couple of disciples with him, but by and large, most of the time, he just slipped away in private. He withdrew himself from the crowd, as some verses and some passages would say. He oftentimes would go to the Mount Olives to go up and pray. You know, it's an interesting thing that we oftentimes, we say, well, I just don't have enough time to pray. But we find time to slip away to do the things that we want to do. We find time to slip away and go hunting. Or we find time to slip away on lunch to go shopping. Or we find time to slip away and go golfing or go vacationing. But do we ever slip away to pray? Do we ever slip away and remove and withdraw ourselves to go to our special place to pray? Some people may say, well, I pray on my way to work and on my way home from work. Well, that's good. But are you limiting your relationship to God to your commute? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all about praying while you're driving. If there's ever a time that I need prayer more than any other time, it's while I'm driving. Because there's so many boneheaded knuckleheads out there cutting me off that I need to pray that I don't hurt them or I don't hurt myself. And oftentimes I need forgiveness for what they did that caused me to say what I said. We oftentimes need to pray while we're driving, but is that the limit of our relationship? Is that the most that we ever pray? We need to find our special place. There's a movie called The War Room. And in it is, I, I really say, the main character. Although, if you look online, it's probably, she's really not the main character. She's a supporting actress. But she is the one that really brings the movie together. Her name's Miss Clara. Miss Clara is the one who introduces the war room to the realtor. Her closet that she had prayed so much about all different things. Sickness, about health, about those who were recovering from a loss of a loved one, for people that want certain things in their lives, who need a job, who just lost a job, for those that are selling a house or buying a house or whatever, her war room, her prayer room, her closet was her place to go. She had written all the prayers up on the wall that she, so she could be reminded daily to pray for those things. Where is our war room? Where is our war place? Where is our quiet place where we can go to God in prayer? where we can get lost in this world and just say, you know, it's just me and God. I oftentimes talk about the end of Hatchet Ridge here in Limestone County or down at the Cal Ford, a place where the river meets the banks and there's very little to absolutely nothing but birds and rocks and water and dirt and grass. And that's it. And you can spend time there alone with God in prayer. It's my amount of olives. Where is yours that we can always be praying? What about you? Where is your place to pray? Here are four ways that we're going to look at to help us have our prayer heard. Many people say, well, I, I just don't pray because it don't ever seem to work. It don't ever seem to do any good. Well, with that attitude, I, I'm not the least bit shocked that your prayer seemingly has not been heard or the answer is not the answer that you desire. Because you seem to be praying without real faith. When we are to pray and we want our prayers heard, we need to pray with real faith. God, I'm going to ask you for something. 
And when we do that, I'm going to quit worrying about it. And I'm going to quit trying to fix it myself. And I'm going to quit messing up the work that you're doing. When we pray, and we pray with real faith, we should pray, and then we should let it go, and then we should let God. I'm going to pray that your will is going to be done. And I hope and I pray that my will will align with your will, and that I will accept your will, and that I will accept your unanswered prayers as the answer that I truly need. We should always pray for God's will. So many of us are selfish in our praying, and myself included, that I pray for what I want, and then I want to get what I prayed for. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 10, when he was teaching his disciples to pray, he says, Thy will be done. And Jesus, in so many times, he prayed this very prayer, Thy will be done. He ended it in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was literally praying for his life he said let this cup pass from me i do not want this death i do not want to endure what i'm going to have to endure in the garden of gethsemane but yet he prayed thy will be done if not father give me the strength to go through with this let this cup pass from me but above all things your will be done in james chapter 4 and verse 3 it says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. What about this? Maybe you've prayed this prayer, and I know that, unfortunately, I'll admit that I've prayed it too. You know, God, if you just let my team win. You know, Father, every Alabama fan's prayer has been this. Lord, if somehow you could... Allow this kicker to get it between the uprights. You know, I promise you I'll go to church on Sunday morning. I promise you that I'll do X, Y, or Z. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. Some versions say you ask amiss. You, you ask for something that is selfish and, and is not necessarily a priority for God. I do not really think that football has really any bearing upon God and His will. I do not think that Alabama football in some ways you know, is, is the number one draw to get people to heaven. Sometimes I think that maybe it could be quite the opposite. You, God, do this for me, and I'll do this for you. God, do this for me, or I won't believe in you. See, really, when we pray these kind of prayers, I think our problem is that we're not praying with real faith. God, I'm not going to believe in you if you don't make this come true. Is that really praying with faith? We really need to be praying with prayer, with faith. We need to be really praying for God's will, not for selfish reasons, not for reasons that are, I'm the only one that glorified from it. I mean, I, my prayer is not, you know, Lord, somehow make this lesson reach a million people so that I can be famous. That's not what it's about. I could pray that this, pray, that this lesson reaches a million people but that's so that he could get the glory, not myself. When I pray because I want to boast or give my own clout among all those around us, I'm asking wrongly. I'm asking for the wrong things in the wrong ways. Third thing that we can do to make sure our prayer is heard is that we can remove sin's place in our life and where sin is in our life. Psalm chapter 66 and verse 18, it said, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. The psalmist says, you know, if I held on to wrong, if I held on to sin in my heart, God wouldn't have heard me. God would not have listened to me. If I would have felt that iniquity, that sin was so important and so valuable to me in my life and held on to it, the Lord's not going to listen. Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says much of the same thing, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Because of our sin, because of our sin, it, it separated us from God. That was the very reason for Christ having to come to earth is to reunite us back to God, to reconcile us back to God. And that sin separates us from God, and so that our voice is not heard, and His face is hidden from us, and our sins have separated us, so that He does not hear 
because his face is hidden from us. If we keep removing ourselves from God, remember Romans chapter 6 and verse 15, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. If you do this, you are slaves in obedience, in obedience to sin, not to God. You are choosing to follow a life of sin and Satan over that of God. We need to remove sin's place in our lives, making Satan no more and quit following and being his servant and his slave. But rather, we need to be focusing on God and us forgiving others. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 25, it says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. In some ways it says, you know, if you remember your sin or that someone has sinned against you or you have sinned against someone else, you stop and you go, you leave, and you go find them and you forgive them and you ask for their forgiveness. Whatever the case may be, we should not allow sin or wrongdoing to continue to reign over us. Is there someone that you're bitter towards right now? Is there somebody you hate? Are you literally sitting around on quarantine and and thinking about ways that, well, when I can get out of this house, I'm going to get even. I'm going to do something to them. We oftentimes think that that's going to make us feel better, but you think about the 30 days of misery you've been having because of the situation. Because of something that they did to you that they very well may not have even realized or known that they did, that you feel that way. We should be forgiving them. Call them up. Send them a message. Write them a card saying, you know, this happened and or that happened or you did me wrong all these years ago, but you know what? I forgive you. I forgive you. It could be a parent. It could be a literal brother or sister. It could just be a friend or an acquaintance from a job or a business deal. We should be forgiving those people, not allowing bitterness and the Satan to hold on to us because of that wrong. We should be willingly and able to let God shine through us and forgive them. If you have that attitude towards somebody it can render your prayer life useless. We have this idea that we need to stand in our relationship and our fellowship with God, and we don't go outside of that. If, if an unconfessed sin or unforgiveness or something else puts a wedge between you and the Lord, communing with the Lord, What is making you more vulnerable? That situation, we need to remove that wedge, whatever it is. So we must first stand in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then everything will be made right. You may say, well, I I just can't find the words to pray. You know, I've tried to pray and I've tried to pray, pray all night. And, and, you know, I, I just can't find the words. Well... Guys, you remember when you were when you were dating, and, and before the age of cell phones, you you would have to use the house phone, and you hoped that you only had one house phone because your mama would be down the hallway or in the bedroom with the other phone, and she could listen in on what you and your girl was talking about. It, you, if you had house phones, you would oftentimes tell tell your significant other that I'm going to call at seven fifteen. And you set up an appointment like that so that you both could be there and you could talk. And if you were any kind of man at all that this was the woman of your heart, you didn't want the conversation to end. And so you may even write out a list of things to talk about that you could ask her about, that you could just get her started and off she would go. Because if she could talk to you and she could console with you, then, then she would be more prone to liking you and hopefully loving you. And so that you could really have her as my girl. So you would write all these things out because you didn't want to run out of words to say. In so many ways we need to find the words to talk to God. Even when we're not praying to God, we need to be writing out things that I'm going to pray about this. Or I need to remember to pray about that. We get a bulletin with our congregation uh, in, a, in a paper format 
normally every Sunday. We get an email as well, and, and during that time, I'll grab that email, and we have a prayer list on the back, and we have upcoming news and concerns, and we pray for those people and, and those things so that, that I can speak their name. Oh, yes, God knows the people that we want to pray for, and He knows the needs that need to be met, and He knows what is best for each and every situation. So the idea that, that I can't find the words should not be an excuse for us to pray, not to pray. Because in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, it says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34 says much of the same thing. Consequently, he is able to save the most uttermost that says the exact same thing if you don't copy and paste it right, Matthew. Here we go. We could have played Jeopardy music right now and it would have filled in the lull. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34 says this, Who is he that commandeth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that he that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. It does say much of the same thing. It says that we have an advocate with the Father. We have someone who is standing there and making intercession for us on our behalf so that our prayers could be heard. It is through Christ that we are forgiven of our sins. It is through Christ that we get the opportunity to pray unto the Father. And it is through Christ that our prayer is heard and our words are made known to God. So without Christ, we are most pitiful. Isn't it wonderful that Christ is the one who taught us to pray? How about you? What is your prayer life like? Let us go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day, the many blessings that you have given us. Lord, we are so thankful for this avenue of prayer where we can just talk to you, that we can just tell you the things that are on our heart and that are on our mind. And Lord, we know you know all things, and it feels so good to get those out, that they be made known to you. Father, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins as we forgive others. Father, we pray that our boldness and our strength and courage will be able to be there to go to those who have maybe done us wrong and that we will willingly forgive them. Father, we pray that we will have the strength and the courage to find that way of escape before we yield to temptation. God, we pray thanking you so much for the blood that was shed on that cross of Calvary so that we could be forgiven and that all the world could be forgiven of the sins that they have committed, that there be no separation made between you and us. And Father, we pray that your will be done in all things. And Father, we pray that we will accept your will and that we long to have your will done. And Father, it is through Christ that we pray. Amen. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say it's what the Lord has done in me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. To the river I will wade. There my sins are washed away. From the heavens mercy stream. Of the Savior's love for me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the land slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. I will rise from the water.
waters deep into the saving arms of God. I will sing salvation songs. Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. So we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul tells the church of Corinth, he says that, he said, I wish it were that you'd come together for the better, but you haven't, it's for the worse. He begins to tell them about some of the things that they are doing wrong within their partaking of the Lord's Supper. How they are doing it and making a commonplace meal out of it, how that one is over here full and another's hungry and one's over here that's drunk and it should not be this way. Every time that we partake of this Lord's Supper, which we do every first day of the week, as commanded, we are to do so in a remembering way of what the Lord has done for us, what the Lord has done in me, and how in doing so we remember the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That bread that we partake of is the body of Christ, which is broken on the cross of Calvary. The fruit of the vine that we partake of is the blood that was shed so that we could be forgiven of our sins. As we are about to partake of the bread, I pray that you will go with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this body, this love of Christ that has been, been given for us, and we pray that you will be with us as we partake of it, that we remember that sacrifice that was given on our behalf, on that tree of Calvary. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us give thanks for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this fruit of the vine which represents Christ's blood that so freely flowed on the cross of Calvary to cover our sins, to make us white as snow. Father, we pray that we do so in a well-pleasing manner unto you and unto him. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Savior, grant me rest and peace. Let my troubled dreaming cease. With the chiming midnight bell, teach my heart that all is well. I would trust my all with Thee. All my cares and sorrows flee. Till the breaking light shall tell, night is past and all is well. I would seek thy service, Lord, leaning on thy promised word. Let my hourly labor 
us tell, I am thine and all is well. We want to thank you for joining us this week for our uh, virtual service. We hope that everything has been done in accordance with God's will. We hope that we continue to worship in spirit and in truth with one another, although distant physically. Uh, we want to encourage you to contact us if you have any questions or concerns or comments at EphesusChurchOfChrist.org. You can find ways to contact us there on that page. You can also like us on Facebook, and you'll be updated any time that we have an update, which we have been doing so very frequently over the last few weeks. And you can also click that subscribe button on YouTube, and you'll be inboxed whenever we have a new sermon or new video that's been uploaded. We hope that you have a great week. Brother Robert will join us again a little while later for another message from God's Word. Have a good one.